player not in the Hall of Fame, Steve Tasker. You guys are out of your territory over your special teams, guys, aren't you? You're a super special. Yeah. Steve Tasker defined what a special team player is. Even Bill Parcells told Marv Levy that he had to game plan around Steve Tasker. Eddie Abramowski. A.B. Do, he was great. He was uh, one of the, he's always, at the time I played when he was there, he was always one of the first guy, play, people in the organization that every player met, head trainer. He had a wealth of knowledge that was, it really can sometimes amazed me. He said, he, he'd say, you know, I got this, I got these symptoms, I got this symptoms, and he, he wouldn't even have to examine you, and he'd say, listen, it's going to be this, it's going to be this long, it's going to feel like this, and it's going to look like this, you know, and he knew. And he'd seen so much over the course of his career because he started when, you know, ice and aspirin was the treatment. And, you know, then it got to the point where it was electrosound, you know, ultrasonic treatments and, you know, uh, electric stem and all the stuff that they use. And, you know, even more modern techniques of using it. He knew how long it was going to take for something to heal and how long you were going to be out. He was, he was a great guy. Plus, he was fun. He was great. We used to play cards in training camp. He was great. Fred Smurlis. Freddie was. Uh, I used to. Freddie used to call my uncle Uncle Gigi. But uh, Fred was an outstanding football player. Played nose tackle in a three-four defense. Nose nose guard in a three-four defense. And went to five Pro Bowls over over s nine years for three or four years through the Hank Bulla era as a head coach. And then also went once with Marv as a, as a nose tackle. He was a great player. Uh, unselfish, great team-oriented guy. Uh, probably a little, little right uh, politically, just to the right of, you know, Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, he's to the right of Newt Gingrich, you know. So it's, yeah, he's, he's pretty conservative in his political leanings. Was there much of that? talk in the, in the clubhouse, kind of non-football political? Not really, not too much. Some, yeah. some, but not really. Only as it really pertained to us, you know, and if it was a story going on or something in the news, we'd talk, everybody'd talk, comment on it, but, you know, you had guys from every walk of life, you know, from every corner of the country, so you had every view, too, as well, so, um, but it's one of those locker rooms. We had a lot of very intelligent guys in that locker room, so if you said something, you better be able to back it up because somebody would shoot it down. You know, they were. You really had to be able to defend your point of view because uh, everybody was fair game. Those who I've talked to, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's Bruce and, and Shane, a lot of people, they all kind of reflect on Daryl Talley as the guy who could really get the most out of players and really push them and yeah. be even, probably the only guy to really get into Bruce's face. Sure. Well, he and Bruce are close. Yeah. Uh, Daryl had a persona about him where the guys on the team really believed he would fight for something he believed in, for the good of the team. Uh, and it didn't matter who it was, whether it was you know, coaches, players, uh, and to his credit, Darrell was always, always stood for what was best for the team. Not best for him, not best for the defense, not best for whoever, for the good of the team, the way it should have been. And uh, that's why you know, when Daryl spoke, people listened, and uh, in Bruce. And uh, let's face it, I mean, we had a good team, and we had Bruce and Jim and Thurman and Andre and, you know, and Fred Smurlis, and, and we had some guys that, uh, you know, that accomplished a few things, and sometimes they needed to be told no, mm -hmm. you know. Sometimes they needed to be told to shut up and sit down, and Daryl would do it, and uh, they'd listen. You talked earlier about a couple of receivers, Andre Reid and James Lofton. You know, here they are, uh, and receivers tend to have their own personalities under themselves. Was that an easy mix to have guys of such AAA abilities? Well, Andre Reid was a was a special athlete. Mm -hmm. He came into the league very rough out of Cootstown State. Had a lot to learn about being a professional receiver. But to his credit, every year he would go and he'd work on something in his game that needed to be worked on. Already had great hands and he was strong with the ball uh, and good ball skills. 
great body control. But you know, like one year he would go out and he wanted to run better routes, and he did, and he absolutely did. He came back running great routes, and he wanted to run better after the catch, and he certainly did the next year. There were things about his game he worked on, blocking downfield, and he was really dedicated to it. And then we had a guy like James Law. We got him in late in the '89 season, James Lofton, and what a what a breath of fresh air he was. Uh, he was a great addition to that team. He was really one of the things. Him along with Cornelius Bennett were one of the th were, were players that not only were great players, but they were also personality who who were catalysts for other players to become great, to relax in some cases, or to become more professional in others. Uh, they had great personalities to, uh, that, that mixed with the chemistry of that locker room, particularly the guys at their position, uh, Cornelius with guys on the defensive front, and certainly James with the receiving core, uh, getting guys to not take it quite so seriously, but then on other levels take it much more seriously. And uh, what, a, what a great addition he was uh, to our team. And I think he helped Andre immensely, not only with his ability to, to draw attention away from Andre, but also off the field, uh, being his friend and his mentor. Did Cornelius Bennett do the same thing for Bruce Smith? Well, I, I think Cornelius was more of a guy who, for Bruce, uh, because there was Daryl who lined up on defense right next to Bruce. And Cornelius helped Bruce most by lining up on the other side. Mm -hmm. He was a phenomenal athlete. Uh, he was a great player, great uh, fast linebacker, great character, a great human being, and one who who cared deeply about the game and about his teammates. Um, I, I, I think if there was one player in that group in our, on our team who did not get the credit he deserved as a football player was Cornelius Bennett. Um, I think he had Hall of Fame ability and uh, he was a Hall of Fame person and uh, I, I would like to see him get more more credit than he has as to this point. You know, you, during that golden era of the early 90s you hear often about the offensive Kelly, Thomas, Lofton, Reed, and often about the defense. You don't hear much about, though we know they were extremely solid, the offensive line. Well, when you talk about what happened to that team and why it kind of stopped being the dominant force it was, it started with the offensive line. We lost Howard Ballard and Will Wolford, the two tackles. And, uh, you know, we lost, that hurt us. Uh, John Fina was supposed to be a guard. But he moved to left tackle and actually was left tackle on two Super Bowl teams. That's how good they were drafting. John Fina was a phenomenal football player. Played extremely well, out of position. And, uh, but, but that, I think, was the start of it all. Kent Hull anchored that line for so many years. And they ran a lot of guys in and out of the right guard position. Uh, but Jimmy Richard was there for as long as he played. Uh, on, on left guard, and uh, and then they moved in uh, John Davis, you know Glenn Parker, uh, different guys were in and out of that lineup. Mitch Ferrat, uh, uh, but Kent Hull was the guy that was kind of the constant on those teams. And I tell them they they changed the rules because of me. I I made it harder on them because they it used to be I would I get you get when you're covering a punt you're out wide. The guys would push they'd push you out of bounds. You know, well it used to be they'd push you out of bounds. I jump behind the players standing on the sidelines and run up unblocked and pop back out on the field. So they, so they I'd do that, you know, if it, if it happened, I'd do that. And then, you know, they outlawed that. You can't do that anymore. And it's a Steve, Ta I don't know, they don't call it that, but it's the Steve Tasker rule. I didn't, I didn't invent it, but I perfected it. And uh, so that now you can't do that anymore. So I, the young guys have a little chuckle over that, but. Uh, What's the rule change. now? If, if they chuck you and you go out of bounds, are you out of, out of the play? No, you can come. You have to make an attempt to come right back in, but they can't hit you until you are back in. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's great. Thanks no so problem. much. I My pleasure. Task is the best special team player ever, which I think he is. That's the most spectacular special teams play I have ever seen. He's first ballot. That's all she wrote, guys.